Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. Happy Earth Day. And my, I want to introduce myself first. My name is Lori Bambaco. I'm a registered dietitian. I specialize in oncology nutrition, and it's my pleasure to try to help individuals that I work with to enhance the cancer fighting properties of their food choices throughout their cancer fighting journey. And I certainly feel like empowered and I empower them uh, to get in the kitchen. And that's where I am today. I'm at the center and I'm inside our demo kitchen and we have lots of different programs, but today is one of my favorites. And this is called Ask the Dietitian. So thank you for watching if you are watching live, but also too, for those of you who have registered. So a little bit more about this program, we offer it once a month and we select a topic of interest. And then participants who register for the program, they can ask me whatever question they want that's relevant to the topic. And I have 30 minutes to try my best and answer those great questions. So I will do what I typically do, and that's to share my screen because I have a PowerPoint that I have prepared to address the great questions that were answered. Thank you for attending today. And if you're interested in learning more about Ask the Dietitian topics in the past, all you have to do is go to our YouTube channel because we record all of them just like we are today. And uh, you can kind of learn at your own pace. But not only will you find Ask the Dietitian recordings on the YouTube channel, but you'll find a host of other different programs and presentations that are offered here at the center. And I think we are such an invaluable resource uh, for anyone who is affected by a cancer. So today on Earth Day, we're going to review a little bit more about how to in the kitchen. So on the agenda, I'm going to try my best to answer those questions that were submitted ahead of time. And this is a typo. I normally have one recipe that I share. Today, I have a handful. And I hope you agree that they are worthy of, of adding to your collection in terms of their nutrition properties. So here are the questions. The first is, if I want to cook a large batch of grains or veggies, how many days will they stay fresh? in the refrigerator? Will the veggies lose some of their nutrients? Are some vegetables better than others? And I think this means in terms of their nutrient composition and are some better to cook in terms of retaining their nutrition? Does it matter if they are steamed or roasted? Next set of questions. I heard both good and bad things about coconut milk and coconut oil. Are they recommended in recipes? And if so, how? And then lastly, when herbs or roots in the whole form like turmeric or ginger are used as tea, are the medicinal qualities still effective or viable? Are the beneficial properties um, still present? Is it worthwhile to drink herbal teas or is it just soothing warmth to the soul? I love that. On a day like today, a nice rainy day, it would be soothing, right? Okay, so let's get to that, the first set of questions. If I want to cook a large batch of grains or veggies, how many days will they stay fresh in the refrigerator and will they lose some of their nutrients if we do this? So let's talk first about whole grains. I like to think of whole grains as nutritional gains, <laughs> and that's because they retain more nutrition from the vitamins and minerals to the antioxidants, to the fiber, to the phytochemicals. So great examples of whole grains are brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, farro, millet, wheat berries, oats, bulgur, buckwheat, and there's even more than that. And I get to try to explore different yummy ways of preparing them inside this demo kitchen. So in a future class, if you wanna know more about interesting ways to prepare them, we might just have to have a, a presentation on that, right? I kind of think that's a good idea. All right, so batch cooking them. Um, I just wanna overview this for anyone who has not considered it. It might be a great option for you. Batch cooking is great because it's meal prep, right? So it saves you time and energy, especially if you're on active treatment or recovering from treatment or surgery. This is so helpful to batch cook. So 
when we do that, we're just going to prepare them as, as instructed and then store them tightly, tightly covered in an airtight container in the fridge for about three to four days. That's how long they'll last in the fridge. But did you know we can also freeze them? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So when we reheat them, we're just going to add a little bit of water or perhaps broth, depending on your desire. And you only have to reheat them for a matter of minutes. We could have them cold right out of the fridge, right? And we can make a green salad or we could toss them with some chopped veggies and a dressing. Or we can toss them also into a soup or a stew. Really practical, helpful way of adding more nutrition. So if we're looking to batch cook them, just think about cooking rice. You add the dry grain into a pot with the water or broth bring to a simmer until all the liquid is absorbed. Now the time varies. So depending on the whole grain, it may require a greater amount, time and liquid mat matters, sorry. So it may require a greater proportion of liquid as well as time to cook that whole grain. For example, example, bulgur requires a one to two ratio of bulgur to liquid and cooks in only a short 10 minutes. Really great option. Wheat berries, on the other hand, they require a one to four ratio of wheat berries to liquid, and they take an hour to cook. Both yummy choices and both offer great nutrition for different reasons. Now, once we, as I mentioned, once we want, once we cook them and we want to store them, they'll keep for about three to four days in an airtight container. And there's lots of different ways to add them. We can warm them up with um, water or broth for a few minutes put them into a salad, a cold salad, a green salad, whatever our heart desires. Did you know, as I mentioned, we could freeze these cooked whole grains. Really convenient too. So the way to do that is that you're going to, after you cook them, you're going to place them on a sheet pan. You're going to let them cool and dry completely. And then you can portion them out into resealable plastic bags. There also are other, um, I think glass containers that are freezable. So if you want, if you prefer that, and they will stay in the freezer for three months. How amazing is that? And I love to use frozen grains, literally taking them out of the freezer and putting them into a soup or a stew. You don't have to defrost them. Really amazing. It's just gonna add some cooking time onto your recipe or you can defrost them. So sometimes I'll pull them out of the freezer and put them in my fridge overnight and they're ready to go the next day. Soft grains like millet or amaranth or teff, if you've ever um, experimented with teff, they can be frozen. However, they're gonna sort of lose their texture. Each of those grains are softer and they sort of cook, as we cook them, they kind of uh, take on a porridge consistency. So you can imagine how they're not gonna freeze the same as something like farro or wheat berries. They're gonna kind of retain their, their texture and their firmness in the freezer. What about vegetables? So batch cooking vegetables, another great idea because you're cooking once and eating twice. They, just like whole grains, are generally best stored in the fridge, airtight. We wanna cool them completely before we put them in the container and they're gonna store for three to four days. When in doubt, throw it out. That's a good rule of thumb. So if you're just not sure, and again, if you're on treatment and you're immunocompromised, I don't want you to risk a foodborne illness. So when in doubt, just toss it. It's not worth the risk, right? Now, does nutrient loss occur after cooking? It does. And here are the factors that influence the loss of nutrients. If we peel and trim our vegetables, if we cook them in water or broth at a high temperature for a long time, this results in, in more loss of water-soluble nutrients. And that really includes the, the group of water-soluble vitamins and also time. So I wanna talk more about that. So how can we save the nutrients in our vegetables, right? Because sometimes we want them roasted or steamed or cooked in a liquid for a long period of time. That's just how we prefer to eat them perhaps. And I don't want you to feel guilty that you're eating them that way and that you're losing so much nutrition that it might not be worth it. There are actionable steps you can take to retain the nutrition in those choices. So I would say first and foremost, store your vegetables properly. And I'm gonna give you a great resource to use because every vegetable is different in terms of how we wanna store it to retain its freshness which is the equivalent of its nutrients as well as flavor, right? The fresher, the better. 
We wanna wash and scrub our vegetables rather than peeling if we can, because guess what? The peel is where every, all the goodness is. Well, the majority of the goodness is. So all those nutrients, they really tend to be on the outside of the fruit or the vegetable. And all it takes is a little vegetable brush and some warm water. So you see that in the image there. And a good example of where the nutrients are found is on a potato. So even if you um, boil the potato, right, we're cooking it, so we're gonna expect some loss of nutrients. But if we boil that potato with the skin, guess what? It contains 175% more vitamin C, 115% more potassium, 111% more folate, and 110% more magnesium than if we peeled it good to know, right? So there is some ability there to re still retain nutrition despite cooking them. If you're not, if you're not one of those people that you prefer maybe peeling the whole thing, maybe try just peeling some of it or half of it. That way, at least you get some of the nutrients. That's an option. And the reason why, again, we want to do that is I gave you the example with the potato, but Antioxidants, which those are cancer fighters, right? They help fix our DNA that gets damaged. They can be over 320 times higher just in the peel alone. So we wanna to try to eat and ingest and infuse those antioxidants from the peel when we can. How else can we save nutrients and veggies? Use the peels for a veggie stock, right? Or on Earth Day, think about using them as a compost to have a little garden out back, right? This way you're sort of somehow um, using those nutrients in some way to benefit yourself. You could steam, roast, or grill. Uh, those are methods of cooking that will retain more nutrition. If you boil them, you could save the water and use this as a nutrient boost when you make a soup or a stock. I love that idea. But I do wanna say, if eating vegetables at all, so whether or not you cook them often and, and mostly in a lot of liquid for a long time, even if you peel them, eating them enough, right? Meaning like regularly, every day, you wanna eat a few of them. That's better than not eating them at all. Okay, so I don't want you to fear if those are the methods you prefer in terms of eating your vegetables. So here's the bottom line. So for both cooked whole grains and vegetables, store them in the fridge for no longer than three to four days. For some great resources on how to retain the nutrition, how to batch cook, how to store them properly so that they're not losing nutrition, I want you to refer to these websites. They, first of all, give you some tips on food safety, right? So when to toss certain fruit or vegetables or whole grains, how to store them. I love this website called Save the Food. So it really helps us reduce food waste in the home. And, and that really helps us keep retain the freshness and again, the nutrients in our fruit and vegetables. And then if you're looking to batch cook and using those leftovers in interesting ways, this website's fun. It's called Budget Bites. So there's a lot of resources and recipes and collections of recipes on that website. Okay, next set of questions. I heard both good and bad things about coconut milk and coconut oil. Are they recommended in recipes? And if so, how? Great question. And isn't this the case with nutrition? You hear good and bad. And uh, it's always my job. It's my responsibility to kind of like give you the bottom line on this information. So let's start first with coconut oil or sorry, coconut milk. So coconut milk does not naturally occur. Did you know that? So they have to take the flesh and they mix it in with water. There's a solid white layer on top of coconut milk, especially if you get canned coconut milk and you'll see this is coconut cream. And some people use this cream and they whip it um, if they're looking to enhance some different desserts that they desire. Uh, coconut milk can be sweetened. So just depending upon your application, I just want you to be aware of that and read the label. Um, coconut itself belongs to the palm family and it grows in Malaysia, Polynesia, and, and Southern Asia. So there's an example of a picture of the coconut tree there, if you have been lucky enough to travel to any of those countries. Um, and technically it is classified as a fruit. So a little bit more about coconut milk. 
um, you might have heard the good things about coconut milk. And one of the good things that is marketed or claimed to be about coconut milk is that it contains medium chain fatty acids. That's the reason why it's good for us. So let's talk more about that. So coconut milk does have medium chain fatty acids, but it also has a lot of other fatty acids. And it technically has more saturated fats, which are long chain fatty acids. And those saturated fats have been shown to raise our lousy cholesterol and maybe even increase inflammation if we're consuming excessive amounts. So when our lousy cholesterol is high, this may raise the risk for cardiovascular disease. So experts at this time, they advise a budget, right? So we don't need to eliminate it altogether, but in terms of saturated fat, we wanna fall within this budget from six to 10% of our calories from saturated fat every day, right? So the greater your risk for cardiovascular disease, the lower amounts of saturated fats you probably want in your diet. So that shakes out to about 13 to 22 grams of saturated fat per day if you're eating a 2000 calorie diet. Not everyone I work with is eating a 2000 calorie diet. So if you're eating less than that, your budget would also be lower. And just for your reference, a tablespoon of coconut milk contains 3.2 grams of fat and almost three grams of saturated fat. So if you put that within that uh, budget, you can see how that's over 20% right there in that single tablespoon of coconut milk for your daily budget for saturated fat. Good to know. So what about using coconut milk? Well, some, some companies actually make blends of coconut milk with other um, nut blends. I often see it combined with almond milk. So what does that do? Well, that displaces most of the saturated fat significantly. So you can just read the label to see for that particular brand. I think that's a great option. You know, if you're still looking because you like the flavor of coconut milk, if you're looking to try to reduce the saturated fat. There are also versions of light coconut milk uh, that are available to us. And light coconut milk is technically 2% of the milk from whole coconut milk. Really interesting. So what happens as a result of using light coconut milk is we reduce the saturated fat significantly. So remember that one tablespoon in coconut milk is about three grams. If we use light coconut milk, we're dropping that down to less than one. So when people use coconut I, milk, I, I think it's best used in traditional forms, right? So if you like curries, you might find that that's a traditional application of using coconut milk and delicious. So that might be some inspiration for you to try and keep in mind that again, like this is, you don't need to avoid coconut milk, but this could be incorporated as part of your overall healthy diet. You may have also heard about golden milk, a very popular recipe that combines coconut milk with turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, and even peppercorns. And this is sounding delicious, right? And it is. Some people will add a little bit of honey for sweet. Um, and gosh, it's just packed with cancer fighting properties. And I did include a recipe uh, for those of you interested to try that. Okay, now onto coconut oil. So coconut oil is made by pressing fresh or dried coconut meat, which happens to be called copra. And refined coconut oil typically uses copra, while virgin coconut oil uses the fresh coconut meat. And refined coconut oil takes on less of the coconut flavor. Okay, so depending on how you want to use it in the kitchen, if you like the flavor of coconut, certainly you can go for virgin. If in your recipe you're looking to really reduce the coconut flavor, that's when the recipe may call for refined versions. Refined coconut oil is made differently. It's heated and then quote unquote bleached using different chemicals and sometimes solvents like hexane are used. So that's just a good to know if that's something that you are particular about in terms of what you want to choose to put in your body. So coconut is coconut oil. The major manufacturers are the Philippines, Indonesia, and India. And the United States is among the top three consumers of coconut oil. What do you know? <laughs> now I want to take a moment to talk about MCT oil. I alluded to MCT oil um, earlier because that's the claim 
that you may have heard is good about coconut milk and coconut oil. So coconut milk, coconut oil claimed to be a good choice because it has MCT fatty acids. It's just a different type of fat. Well, MCTs, this different type of fat, the research suggests that they are quickly absorbed and used by the body. And so they travel right to our liver and they are rapidly used for energy. This is sort of a good thing when it comes to fats because then we're less likely to store those fats. And if we're less likely to store them, then they're not gonna wreak havoc on the body, especially if we're consuming a lot of them. And that is what the research has at this point alluded to is that 100% MCT oil, it may promote satiety, a feeling of fullness, and it may prevent our, our body's storing of this extra fat. So coconut oil and coconut milk does have some MCT oil, but only a little bit. Most of it is actually lauric acid, a different type of fatty acid, and this is not an MCT fatty acid. Lauric acid is absorbed slowly and metabolized just like other saturated fats. So coconut oil and coconut milk is not MCT oil. So a lot of the marketers and these good claims about how good coconut milk and coconut oil are for us, they're taking advantage of the fact that it contains a little bit of MCT oil, but they fail to mention that it also has all of these other saturated fats in its package. Okay, so I want you to keep that in mind and just apply some healthy skepticism. So coconut oil, most of the experts say we really should try to minimize it and really think about that budget as it relates to adding it in, in a healthy diet. So 82% of the fat in coconut oil is saturated. Just for reference, butter has 62% saturated fat. So if you have an opinion about butter, <laughs> now you might also have an opinion about coconut oil. So some of the saturated fats in coconut oil do not raise the lousy cholesterol. We know this, but it doesn't counteract the effects of all the other saturated fats that are in it that do raise lousy cholesterol. So we want to keep that in mind. If we have coconut oil in the house, we want to keep it in a cool and a dry location. And we don't want it to spoil, right? Because if it's spoiled, we do not want to put spoiled oil into our body. So signs of spoilage are a yellow tint, mold, obviously, or you can give it the sniff test. So if it has an off odor or even an off flavor, that's a sign that the oil has, has spoiled. So using coconut oil, maybe you're like, I still want to use it. Uh, what a lot of recipes and this coconut oil is also, I have to say, very trendy because there are a couple diets that are very trendy right now. The ketogenic diet and also the vegan diet. So if you're looking to replace or use more fat, like on the ketogenic diet, what a great ingredient choice coconut oil would be, right? Because it's so high in fat and it's also vegan. So it, it's, it's suitable for anyone who is pursuing that type of diet. And a lot of times you'll find it's used as a replacement for butter or for vegetable shortening or lard. <laughs> and if you think you wanna do that in your recipes, give it a try. So 25%, you would just use 25% less than the amount listed in the recipe because it's just so concentrated uh, that it has different properties when it's um, used in the, in, especially in baking recipes. You could give it a whirl by sauteing some vegetables. It's gonna give it a different flavor. Um, or add a little bit to your curries or sauces, right? That's gonna really enhance, especially if you like coconut flavor, it's gonna enhance that flavor. Now, I like to recommend it as a moisturizer. <laughs> so we're not putting it in our body, we're putting it on our body. And a lot of people do enjoy using it on their skin or even on their hair. So just a small amount and massaged into the skin, or if you have dry or frizzy hair, a small amount onto the hair shaft. Actually, you could leave it in, some people leave it in overnight and then wash it out the next day. It's a great moisturizer. And again, I think it has a wonderful uh, aroma. So if that's something that you do like, I think it's a, an interesting way to apply it into your lifestyle. So here's the bottom line on coconut milk and coconut oil. I would say treat them both as a, as a treat, right? So especially coconut milk uses as treat sparingly. We know that it does have saturated fats that can raise lousy cholesterol. Try a light or a blended version. 
view coconut oil like you would butter, right? So if you're kind of thinking, oh, butter's not good for me, I want you to also think the same of coconut oil. It's a suitable substitute if you're on a specific diet, but we think it sort of acts a little bit like butter in terms of its health properties. It can fit into a healthy diet just like butter can, but we just wanna be aware of how much. And just for your information, if we're looking to enhance nutrition in our diet, there are some nourishing fats that come from plant foods as well. So extra virgin olive oil is a great example. It contains so many great helpful properties to consider. Okay, next set of questions. I know I'm short on time, so I'm gonna move through these rather quickly. Uh, when herbs or roots in the whole form, like turmeric or ginger are used as tea, are the medicinal qualities still effective or viable? Are the beneficial properties still present? Is it worthwhile to drink herbal teas? or is it just soothing warmth to the soul? <laughs> so what is in ginger that happens to be so beneficial? That's the chemical structure of gingerol, which that's really the main constituent that has been studied in terms of the research for its benefits, its healthful benefits. Um, these constituents have a variety of different, literally pharmacological properties. So they've studied ginger and they have found it has antipyretic, anti analgesic, antitussive, anti-inflammatory, has sedative properties, did you know that? Antibiotic, it has weak antifungal, uh, but also other properties to it. Each constituent performs differently, right? So depending on what you wanna use it for, you would use a different dose or a different version of ginger in order to reap the benefits according to the research. So a good example is if you had osteoarthritis, what research has shown is that specifically ginger extract for that dose and that amount of time can modestly improve pain compared to a placebo. Good to know. Another good example is, this is very common, right? Pregnancy or chemo induced nausea and vomiting, certain dose, certain uh, amount of time during the day for a certain length of time has been used and has been shown to be beneficial. So you can see where really you wanna match the amount and the dose and the timing with what its properties are for. There's lots of different forms of uh, ginger. You may be aware of this. So the research studies look at all different forms and there's really no consistent um, answer at this point in time. They use syrups, they, they put ginger in biscuits, there's capsules, tablets, there's teas, usually as the fresh root. People will take dried root, they'll take extracts of it. So that's why it's really difficult to give kind of a definitive bottom line about using ginger. They all have different uh, varieties of composition, right? So what one study has suggested is that gingerol, that active constituent, that's the most studied, the amount in each of those different types of products can range. Some tests have shown it literally had like none up to almost 10 milligrams per gram of gingerol. So it requires a lot of extra, a lot of extra homework. And I don't expect you to be able to do that on your own. And that's what someone like me as a dietitian can help you determine. We do, we don't have a practical way, right? So no one really off the, if you're going to the pharmacy or um, at the grocery store and you're looking at the shelf, we don't really know, like how do we know, pick out the right product for us, right? But this is where we turn to food, right? So we know we can use ginger spice or we can use the ginger root. And really that's as a dietitian, what I would advise because that's the package that's the most beneficial and, and a guarantee in terms of its content and what's absorbed in the body and traditionally how it was used as medicine. Now, if you are considering a supplement, I, just, I would just encourage you to discuss this with your healthcare provider. Now, what about turmeric? <laughs> so turmeric is a member of the Zingerberaceae family. <laughs> Say that five times fast. It's actually a cousin of ginger. They're both uh, rhizomes, they're both roots. And the active constituents in turmeric are curcuminoids or curcumin. And you may have heard of that word and that's what that image is on the slide. Uh, curcuminoids have uh, analgesic anti-Alzheimer anti-arthritic, anti-cancer, anti-depressant, anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial, antioxidant effects, as well as kidney and liver protective effects. It's like, what is turmeric not good for, right? It sounds like we all should be using it. 
Now, again, the amounts and their effectiveness vary. So for someone who has osteoarthritis, 400 milligrams twice, two to three times a day seem to have reduced knee pain in a research study. And for symptoms of depression, one gram daily for six weeks improved symptoms of depression when it was taken with an antidepressant. So you can see like how much to take and how often to take it and with what and for what condition, it all varies. And so for this general presentation, this is the best answer I can give you. If you're looking for more, I want you to discuss it with your healthcare provider. Lots of different forms of turmeric, just like ginger. In the research, they look at gummies, they look at tablets and capsules. They all have different compositions. We don't have a practical way. So when we're at, again, the pharmacy or the grocery store and we're looking on the shelves, we don't really know what, how much to use or which one to use, right? Because the research hasn't definitively given us those conclusions yet. So just like ginger, food sources of turmeric are preferred. And don't forget the spice. Sometimes that's easier to use or more accessible than the turmeric root is for you. Now, if your healthcare provider has suggested and you've had that conversation, then a supplement might be advised, but you have to have that conversation first. Now, what about teas, right? Because the question was asked, what about herbal teas? Are they beneficial? Well, let's start first with tea. What is so beneficial about tea? Well, true teas come from the Camellia sinensis plant. And so that includes our group of oolong, black, green, and poor tea. All teas have varying amounts of polyphenols. So these polyphenols are phytochemicals that have bang for buck in terms of their disease fighting properties. And the list goes on and on and on. It's really exciting stuff. Now the amount of polyphenols matter based on the growing conditions of the tea, the leaf age, and the storage both during and after transport. So it's kind of like our ginger and turmeric. We don't really know how much is in our products. And so therefore the research is inconsistent. We, when they look at research and they look at people who drink teas, they're drinking different amounts, they're preparing it in different ways, they're using different products at the start. So we really have no way of knowing, you know, how much should you have specifically. Now, what I find interesting is also we have, we all have the different gut microbiota, which might convert the tea compounds differently. So even if we drank the same preparation of tea, our bodies might be using it differently just based on that. And then also genetics plays a role. So we might not absorb them as well, or we might absorb them very well based on our genetics. And I, I find that to be very fascinating, but we don't have a practical way of guiding that at the moment. So now are herbal teas worthwhile? Because herbal teas are not true teas. Herbal teas are made from a combination of flowers, bark, rhizomes, and the leaves of non-tea plants. So you might find a turmeric tea that is an herbal tea, for example. Sometimes they're marketed as medicinal, right? So you'll see this in the grocery store on the shelf. It, they may market like elderberry tea for immune boost. They may market chamomile tea to relax us or mint tea for digestive health. They may or may not have a true tea in them. Now remember how I just kind of sang the praises of true teas. They have so many helpful properties because of those polyphenols. These herbal teas generally lack those polyphenols. And that there is the elderberry plant. I had to include it because I think it's so pretty. So I think herbal teas are still worthwhile, right? Because they're delicious, or maybe we're looking for some sort of medicinal um, benefit to them. And I think it can be a compliment right, in a healthy lifestyle, in the appropriate amounts, right? So if we're looking to support our immune system, all the elderberry tea in the world is going to necessarily matter if we're not addressing all the other components in our lifestyle. And so just be well informed. There's a limited amount of evidence that exists to support how effective these herbal and medicinal teas are. And there could be some potential interactions. If you're on a prescription or a treatment or you're taking over the counter products, we, we wanna just be careful about what we're taking. So the bottom line on ginger turmeric and our teas, consider using your spices, ginger, turmeric, or the root in your cooking. And I gave you, I'm giving you some recipes after today. 
So I got some ideas for you. If your teas are preferred, consider loose leaf options. So there's some tea houses or some spice houses. Loose leaf teas are gonna be more fresh. So keep that in mind. Remember, fresh equals nutrients, right? It retains more of the nutrients. We can assume these products retain those compounds. So there's an image of different loose teas and you can make your own or brew them any way that you'd like in a French press, uh, lots of different applications. You could brew the tea from the root and I've done this and I've included a recipe here as well and enjoy unsweetened varieties of true and herbal teas. Right? They're all great options. I think the best bet is to make sure that they're not loaded with extra sugars, right? So here's uh, an image of some ginger and turmeric, the root with some water and some obviously some lemon slices. And you see after you heat that on the stove, the beautiful color that's retained in that beverage, that's your tea. And imagine the beneficial properties that you've infused. You're gonna strain off the, ju the ginger and the turmeric and you're gonna enjoy all those healthful compounds that are in it. So here are some suggestions and the recipes that I will share for those who have registered a vegetable soup, no big cookies that uses some of that coconut oil, that golden milk that I promised, a ginger turmeric tea, and something yummy like a vegetable curry. I think these are all great applications that are a package of nutrition within the whole recipe. And my last slide, stay tuned for our next Ask the Dietitian. We're gonna talk about food and its influence on our mood. So that's scheduled for Friday, May 20th at the same time. And here's some example of questions that might be submitted. Which foods lift my spirits? Coffee is a feel good food or chocolate, coffee for me. It's a feel good food. So should I eat it regularly? all just kind of inspiration for questions that we will address in the next session of Acid Dietitian. So I'm gonna stop my share now.